Okay, good morning. Um, welcome to Keep Calm and Recover. Uh, so this uh, talk has actually changed a little bit because like most talks, when you kind of begin and you write the initial sort of intro, you have these like huge goals, right? And then the more I put into that, the larger the talk got. And then I realized, well, I can't have all of these things without including these kind of lower level things. And once I then began to trim it back, it was like, oh, okay, so we're here. So that's really where I've added uh, the kind of question mark there. Um, it's not going to be hugely PowerShell based, we will touch on it, but what I mainly want to talk about this morning is the whole uh, a recovery process and what we generally go through when we're uh, responding to a, a cyber attack and having to bring some of the largest environments in, in the world back online. So if that's what you want to hear, hang around. Um, otherwise, if you leave, uh, that's uh, totally fine as well. Uh, so first of all, thank you to everyone who makes this uh, uh, happen. Um, if you get a chance uh, to go out, see the booths. Um, if you haven't already, uh, please do. Right, so there we go. Um, so my name's Matt. Um, I work uh, uh, now part of Google. Um, we were acquired uh, near the end of last year, but um, what we primarily do is security, um, and we're well known around the world for IR. Um, and over the last uh, couple of years, we've been getting more into building a really good remediation team as well, um, and that's what I work on. So uh, my career uh, so far, particularly if you know uh, me off of prior talks and prior events, um, I've uh, been working for nearly 10 years on, on credential uh, 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 theft mitigation, um, and now more into the incident recovery scenario. Um, I used to be a MVP as well. Um, so, as I mentioned, I work on um, the STS team, um, and really our role, we have two main goals. Uh, one is uh, the proactive side, which is really working with different large enterprises uh, to help them to implement more proactive controls that will help them to limit the impact of a, a cyber attack and to recover quicker when that happens. Uh, generally, they do happen at some point. Uh, we're just really trying to help it uh, to be less impactful. The other side of what we do is we roll with the IR teams. So when there's a uh, security incident that happens, uh, normally the uh, security operations centers will notice that, they'll then a kickoff and IR, and the IR team are really there to look at what happened and how that's happened. We roll with them to then help contain what's happening and then uh, help to remove unauthorized parties from uh, various networks. Um, we're a team of over 100 uh, people worldwide now, um, and primarily from like architecture and from ops. Uh, so we've uh, kind of done uh, the hands-on work that we're getting you to do. So in rolling with the uh, frontline teams, there's a lot that we learn along the way about kind of different things that most people who are managing Windows environments are good at, what they're not good at. Um, and kind of different things that will hold them up along, along their journey from being able to recover quickly. Um, we cover every tech, we cover networks, we cover Windows, Linux, Azure, AWS, uh, Google. 
Um, primarily, most of the environments which are, are being um, attacked now and, and kind of compromised are windows. Uh, so a lot of our time really goes into helping to clean that up. So I like to say that we're expensive window cleaners, um, which is a translation lost when your parents tell your other relatives what you do, but it's actually really good upset. So. Um, so to give you just a, a overview first of how a normal attack works and then how we would remediate so that I kind of give some context into what I'm actually going to talk about uh, tech-wise. How many people have been involved with a recovering from a, a cyber attack of some kind so far? Excellent. Okay. Um, and was it generally ransomware? Do you have hands? APT? And did you love it? <laughs> it's a terrible experience, right? It's, it's actually sort of, um, I like to say it's, or I don't uh, like to say, but it is actually generally the worst uh, time of, of people's working lives, right? When that first happens. Um, uh, so when you join a team like this and, and roll around kind of seeking out those high pressure uh, scenarios, there's probably something wrong with you, but that's what we do. Um, so really there's uh, two kinds of attacks that we would primarily uh, uh, work on uh, to recover. Um, APT, which is generally when someone, at least one other party's in your network and they're trying not to be found. They're looking to be there for the long term um, as a way to complete whichever goals they have next. Um, and then the other popular one at the moment as well is ransomware, uh, which is a little more obvious that it's happening because, of course, they want you to know that they're there, they want you to have downtime, um, and they want to get paid. So how we recover to that generally has... Uh, two frameworks, um, and they're roughly aligned but slightly different as well. So when you're working on containing and remediating an APT, uh, generally you'll do something first called posturing, which is where you're trying to increase the level of logging and, and give yourself a much better view of what's going on across the whole environment so that you're able to work out how you need to remove these uh, uh, folks from the uh, network. Then you'll go into doing containment, which is all about limiting further credential theft, limiting lateral movement, uh, helping to kind of limit the attacker from achieving their goal. And then you'll move into a period where you're able to remove them from the network. Ransomware slightly different in that you'll... It, it's generally something you need to rush uh, to contain first to limit the spread and limit the damage. So it's a lot more obvious and a lot more rapid. Uh, and then you go into a restoration uh, phase, which is really where you're trying to bring everything back online. So think about VMs which have been encrypted, uh, like backups, uh, that have been deleted, all of those different things, you're trying to get everything back online. Again, uh, that needs to be very rapid as well because every day someone's down, they're losing money. Um, then again, you probably need to eradicate someone as well, right? Because these two attacks can turn into each other. A ransomware generally means you've had an APT in your environment for a while and now they're choosing to make themselves know, or they've actually sold the access that they have onto another party who's just going to go nuts. Um, but you've had an APT there, and even if you haven't dealt with, although you may have now dealt with and recovered from the ransomware attack, 
the APT may be there, you don't know yet, right? Equally, if you find an APT, it they may be getting ready to do a ransomware attack or selling the access onto another party who will, or if they know that you know they're there, that may be what happens next, right? So they're very interlinked, but the recovery for these two generally will take about four weeks. If you're lucky and you're really good and you're really quick, and that's where PowerShell generally comes in, with a ransomware, you can be up again within two weeks, but generally it's a month or a little more. APTs, generally four weeks to six weeks, which really depends on how, how deep they are. Whichever one you have, whichever way you go, what this actually translates into is a huge long list of tasks given to you by someone like me of things that you need to do within your environment. That task list generally can be 80, 90, 100 tasks. And if you think about how your environment works and how your ops work, maybe that's going across multiple teams and across multiple continents and, and it can be really hard to get through those. Uh, so again, that's where things like PowerShell come into play. But everything we're looking to do while we uh, recover these is we're looking to interrupt uh, what's known as the attack life cycle. So just a high level on that. Um, as we use frameworks for recovery, attackers pretty well use a known methodology for how to get into your network as well and how to do what they want to do. Everything we're doing as part of recovery is all about interrupting that. So time's really critical and, and how fast you go really depends again on uh, who's in house, uh, how good uh, they are, how many resources, you can get, and as well, how much you're going to limit yourself and how hard you are, are going to make your, your own life as well for the recovery thing. Um, so that's a high level of what we do and, and sort of where we're going. And it's not just us who work like this, pretty much every recovery you'll do Anyone you work with, they generally kind of do things at the same way. That's pretty well sort of tried and, and proven now. So what we're looking to get out of this is related to these recovery phases um, and, and the goals that I had by way of, of talking and uh, demos was uh, to take you through some of the core controls that we would want implemented or validated when we're trying to do containment, no matter whether it is an, an APT or a ransomware, and how we can help uh, uh, PowerShell come into play uh, to make those things a little bit easier. And I'll share some tales along the way of how I've seen people make their lives harder by doing things like um, once they know the attackers have used PowerShell, they're like, we need to disable PowerShell everywhere. Turn it off. And some people actually do that against good advice uh, and and end up adding more time onto the recovery process. But um, what I really want to do is rather than kind of, of giving you the answers for how to do the different things, just kind of place in your mind like, this is what we would be looking for and it's what you should have in, um, in your configs now. And really kind of think, where are you with that? Do you know you have some gaps? when it comes to be your turn, would you do something else? Can you do it another way, right? It's, it's really just how to get your mind going. Now, 
like all good talks, you have good demos. Uh, demo gods are not on my side today. I was I was sitting here powering up, watching uh, the prior talk, and just uh, thinking, why is nothing working in the way that it was last night? But um, so I'll try to do the best I can and and walk through uh, some different things. But it's not what I had planned, and and I can only apologize for that. So going back to what we talked about a moment ago around rushing to disable PowerShell, um, it's actually very, very common to see that happening, um, a Jaren recovery. And I've worked with other recovery providers as well who, who will advocate to do that. Um, I really don't because PowerShell, particularly when you have a huge list of, of 80 to 90 tasks, is an invaluable tool to get through recovery. What usually happens is it's more of a feeling that we can't trust where it's being used or who's, who's using PowerShell. If we leave PowerShell turned on, then surely the attacker who might be in our our environment, they can go and use it as well, and we're sort of fighting against that. So that's where we usually would use a lot of the Windows firewall as a way to begin to secure the access to PowerShell on remote machines. Now, most environments have another third party firewall product or another product managing Windows firewall. Um, and, and really there's, well, there's actually two kinds of, of people. Those who have turned uh, the Windows firewall off and will shamelessly tell you that they have with a big grin. And those who are letting another product manage it and not realizing that the product is not really managing it. It's not really doing much with it. So uh, during recovery, this is actually one area that we put a lot of, of effort into getting that uh, turned on. And it's actually really, um, uh, I really like it because it in overall Windows Firewall is about 20 years old now. When you talk to anyone about turning it on across the enterprise, if it was like uh, the Drake meme, they'd be like, no, no, I'm not going to do that and uh, uh, have a bad day. But then like, um, are you willing to just uh, use AI without ever knowing how that actually works? Yeah, got it. it it's exactly like that. It just blows my mind. but. When you know how the Windows firewall works, it's such a, a powerful tool and particularly for being able to control PowerShell. So that's what we're going to take a little look at in a moment. So this would be how we begin to control the environment a little bit, right? Because if you think about how attacks work that use PowerShell, uh, to help the attack move, what they generally do is once they're onto the box, they will reach out uh, to the web or reach out elsewhere to another IP, download something that they want to execute and then execute it. Using policies within AD, and of course you can do this other ways, right? Generally the way that we want to do this is with AD policies so that everything's like self-contained and there's no control from the outside elements, right? But you can then begin to limit where PowerShell's allowed to talk to. So rather than like disabling PowerShell altogether and trying to put in complex app locker policies and, and prevent it uh, from running a tool and preventing even you from using it, you can just easily limit the 
where it's allowed to talk to, uh, so be that the local subnet, the internet, or known bad IP addresses. And it's actually a really good way as well to remove um, a PowerShell v2. Um, so if I just flick over for uh, uh, some Windows firewall action, I did have like a, a demo prepared, but that one's not working. So I'm going to just uh, take you through um, some quick rules. How many people are using Windows Firewall now? Good. Really? Excellent. Okay, and and are you using that to limit uh, PowerShell talking to different things already? You are, you are, other people not? Okay. Um, so one thing you can do, uh, particularly um, so on the outbound rules is if you want to go and hmm? to zoom it, I can only try and make my screen a little bigger. Does that help? Okay, great. Sorry. Yeah. Anybody remember the path to the PowerShell executable? Ah, oh, there you go. That'll do. So there's a really cool thing that not a lot of people realize, but you can actually... Um, and now that I'm trying to do it live, I'm going to forget. So in terms of if you want to limit the actual uh, uh, PowerShell EXEs and where they can communicate to, rather than having to know the IPs, you can list from these predefined networks. So if you want to allow PowerShell internally and limit it from talking to the internet, there's pretty much a pre-created rule for you. You can just use that. Right? And that's going to prevent the scenario of where if an attacker's on your box, they're trying to download something, then you can contain that. And you can take it down to as limited as you need to be. Um, and, uh, and that's going to help you keep PowerShell available for you to use as part of the recovery process. Right. The other thing, um, the other thing we can do so once we have the firewall enabled the logging turned on so that we're, we're sort of limiting the different things that can uh, uh, talk outbound um, and that we're logging any problems as well that we may run into is that we can then begin to limit uh, who can connect into PowerShell from our remote machines because we want to keep it available, we want to keep it in use, but it comes back to, well, what if the attacker is able to continue to connect to it as well and run different things? So uh, that's where we would uh, generally use IPsec uh, controls to then authenticate from the recovery machines we're using to, to the target machines. And on the targets, we can actually limit which accounts and which computers are allowed to connect to things like RDP and WinRM and then block that for every 
everything else. Is anybody using this with Windows firewall rules at the, the moment? Are you doing IPsec? Yeah, it's always a few. Um, so in a recovery scenario, what you would generally create are, are tactical pause, um, uh, hardened machines you can use that are entirely new, um, security is well tuned up, they're running a good EDR, you're using a new account, and that's what you would use to begin to take uh, control of your, your environment, right? Um, when you mention IPsec, usually people sort of tense up because we're used to kind of thinking like, ah, oh, certificates, encryption, all of that kind of stuff. And it's like very, very easy to turn on. You could actually do it now. Um, so all you need to really do is create a connection security rule that would need to apply to the target endpoints that you're looking to manage and also to the uh, tactical pause that you're using for the recovery effort. And what you really want to do is create a connection security rule. Um, I usually run through the full wizard. Um, and, sorry, hang on. This is the pressure of live demos that I like to avoid. Hang on. Yeah. There you go. So um, any IP address going to any IP address, the requirement that you want to have is that you want to have request authentication turned on. So that then actually means that it is pretty well completely harmless. Any protocol, any port. What will happen is when the two endpoints uh, try to talk, they'll try to do a Kerberos authentication to each other. If they can authenticate each other, they'll just uh, 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 set up a handshake so that they know they are who each other is meant to be. And what that then enables you to do is create inbound rules you can um, uh, push out as well, where you're then able to override any block rules. So you can generally then block WinRM going in, SMB going into your servers, endpoints, all of those different things that would make it harder for an attacker and then open it up just for you. So if you just run through, open up your, um, I don't remember the PowerShell port, 5995. Sorry? That's the one. I'm under pressure up here, thanks. Hey, five. Uh, you can then override any block rule if the connection is secure. In other words, have the two machines authenticated to each other, right? And that is where you can then say, well, who's allowed to override it? Let's add our brand new accounts, which we're creating for the recovery, which I'm doing a local um, uh, policy here because my AD's having some challenges, but you would pick your new accounts and your like tactical machines you're using for the recovery. Those can then be used uh, to get into PowerShell on any box and you know that that will work for you and limit that pathway for the attacker. Even if they were able to compromise your new accounts, they would need to get onto an authorized machine to be able to continue doing what they're doing. Of course, that will change what they do. They'll try to use other tools, but it's a continual kind of cat 
and mouse game along that um, uh, way. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, um, that would then mean that you're able to then override and continue to use PowerShell for your recovery while keeping it uh, uh, turned on. And that is huge. It's really, really huge. All of the remote admin tools you would usually use, like Windows Admin Center, uh, Server Manager, anything which runs over WinRM over those rules would continue to work as well. So on your poor, um, that would be what you're you're looking to have. Of course, mine's a, a little bit broken today, so I can't kind of go through to show you that. Um, but important thing to point out next is that in a recovery, the more remote work we can do, the better. Um, because what we're really trying to do is limit more opportunity where your new credentials and the new admin permissions you have uh, can be stolen and used, right? So, um, that is where we want to avoid doing things like logging on over RDP, because at the moment, in that uh, our recovery phase, we we don't necessarily know how much we can trust those endpoints, right? Because the way the IR works is uh, that's going to be then deploying agents, reading data, working out what happened across all those endpoint machines in order to profile the attack and where the attacker is, right? So logging in over RDP is not really a good idea. It will put uh, the credentials into memory where they can be be taken. And I've seen many um, uh, times where this happens because everybody kind of has the mental thinking of if I'm logging onto the onto the uh, box interactively, I can trust that. But actually, it's the other way around. And the more you can do with remote tools, even down to remote PowerShell connections from, from the shell, invoke command, all of those different things. The more you can be comfortable with that, the more chance you've got of protecting those highly privileged credentials or those other credentials which attackers may use to continue moving around your network. Um, so there's actually a good YouTube uh, a video by a friend and uh, former colleague of mine that uh, I'll put here for you to watch is RDP the the devil. Um, people who work in recovery think yes because it it can actually set you back weeks when credentials continue to be popped and you're continuing to have to chase and shut things down. So um, another way that you can um, help to limit the attack and to uh, do some containment, and particularly around tier zero, so tier zero being uh, primarily domain controllers and any account that has domain admin rights, is that you can use a feature called authentication policies and silos, which is, it came out in, I think, 2012 R2. We do not see enough use of it out in the world, but it can really help you out. Um, with anything high value where you're looking to limit who can log into it and from where they can log on, uh, it's a a really good thing to do. So there was one environment that I worked in where for the attacker was coming in over the VPN. So this was actually very common during COVID time. It continues 
had to be coming now because everybody's remote working and everything had to be set up very quickly. So a lot of VPNs that would connect you into the internal network never used MFA. Even if they are using MFA, MFA is a problem because there are times where you don't really know that people who have enrolled in MFA for a certain account are actually legit. Attackers will uh, generally, when they compromise a Windows environment, if they can enroll their own devices into MFA, they will do that. And if your MFA enrollment is not tight, then they can do that, right? Um, so they were coming in over the VPN um, using non-domain joined machines. Um, they had compromised credentials where they could uh, connect. And then at that point, they were on the network. One way or another, they were continuing to get DA credentials. Um, I don't quite recall how, but what they were then able to do was from their non-domain joined machine, they were able to initiate commands against domain controllers, given valid DA credentials. And it, of course, just works because it's a valid login. Authentication policies and silos are a way to put an authentication firewall around where those uh, uh, tier zero accounts are allowed to be used, right? So one way that we generally um, use this is, and I think this one will work because... I looked at it this morning. I'll put into the deck as well um, a more kind of detail on how you would go about looking at, at this. But essentially, a authentication policy is the kind of authentication that you're allowed to do, right? A protocol um, and a length of token, and you can have uh, limits around where you're actually allowed to log on. So what we would generally do is create a authentication silo, which is a ring fence around certain accounts and around certain machines. So in that silo, you would generally add your uh, tier zero accounts and your tactical pause um, so that you only want those accounts authenticating interactively onto these machines. And then through the authentication policy and uh, the two linked together, you can then have rules which say if an account that's linked to this authentication policy tries to authenticate, then it must be in this authentication silo or what it is attempting to authenticate to must be a domain controller or other tier zero server. And then the computer that's trying to authenticate it must be in the tier zero authentication silo as well. And you can set this up uh, pretty quick with PowerShell. I'll give you some sample code. But that will then uh, create a kind of ring fence around how you're able to get to certain machines, and particularly domain controllers, which generally is where and most uh, things are going to be comprom um, where most credentials are going to be compromised from. So by doing that, even though that particular company I mentioned had to continue with SFA or 
or single factor authentication for their VPN for some time because it actually takes a long time to get it switched on. And they couldn't put in all the different firewall rules we were sort of saying well, they should uh, for different reasons. They were immediately able to protect the DA credentials and domain controllers and then anything else identity as well, like ADFS, AD Connect, because we could pull those into the silo and then run a check every day to make sure that we had captured it. Anything that wasn't there, I pull it into the firewall as well. So, yeah, so that uh, is authentication silos. I think the last thing I want to touch on very quickly um, is the clean source concept um, and just uh, talk a little about the rebuild processes and and particularly when you're you're doing something dis, um, to recover from something like ransomware. So in a in a recovery of any kind, APT and ransomware, you're generally having to do some form of server rebuild and some form of tool deployment. Um, in a APT scenario as well, we sometimes uh, see that they are actively trying to replace things like our agents with their own tools uh, so that people will uh, run their tools thinking they're deploying our agent. Um, and then as well, particularly in a ransomware scenario, there's lots of rebuild happening. You know that you've had an APT and you don't know how much you can trust your images, all of those different things. There's care that you need to take in all the packages you're using, software you're, you're using. In a, in a um, high pressure recovery scenario like that, it is amazing how fast everybody wants to, to run. Uh, copying things here, uh, copying VHDs there, packages. Um, what I would encourage you to do is uh, get familiar with a process or create a kind of internal sort of recovery process that allows you to track. And it can seem very cumbersome as well, but allows you to track uh, what are the clean source uh, software packages that you have and what their hashes are so that when you need them in a recovery scenario, you're able to do a continual kind of validation every time you pull a package or, or copy something. Um, and you can version control that as well using Git. Anything that changes that, of course, is going to trigger a little pop-up to say, Hey, your package may have changed. Um, another one as well is around uh, patching during recovery. When you're doing server recovery, server rebuilds, the amount of patching you need to do is generally quite huge. And in a ransomware, this is actually one of the things which attackers will try to take out first, like backups and patching. Now, most people at the wrong time realize that they don't have a plan B for how they're going to do patching of new builds because like, of course, uh, WSUS will take care of it. A config manager will take care of it. Uh, a big fix will take care of it. And if you've ever tried to create a new temporary WSUS server and have that performing properly in, in a very quick time, um, it, you probably need some therapy at, at some point. Um, it, it's not fun. Um, and, and what I would really recommend is looking at this as a priority for plan B. So internally sort of set up your own DSC template, 
uh, keep patches uh, synced. There's a really good uh, module as well, KB Update. It is magical. If you get some time, play around a little uh, with that, create some VMs, try to patch them. This is what you'll need if you need to do rapid recovery and rapid rebuilds without what you would normally rely upon. So um, I'll make a call out to just have a look at that. And with that, I know I'm a little bit over time and I've not paused for questions yet. Uh, if anyone has any queries, let's, uh, yeah, let's have it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's upset. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, I'll be around. So if there's any topic uh, coming to mind, happy to chat about it. I kind of live and breathe this. So um, yeah, happy to talk about anything related to recovery. Uh, and thank you for coming.